One thing I get asked fairly often about my painting work is how do I choose color? It didn't take long putting together this presentation for me to realize that to try and teach someone how to paint with gouache is to try and teach someone how to use color effectively, which if how many times I've tried recording this presentation is any indication, that's harder than it sounds. It seems silly to say, but color is my favorite part of painting. It never seems to get any easier though, and I don't fault anyone for feeling intimidated by it, especially if you've ever wasted actual paint you've spent actual money on desperately trying to save something from the garbage. I also don't think it helps that color, as we now know it and often take for granted, has never been more accessible. For all of human history, up until about 150 years ago, color was hugely expensive and often more of a sign of wealth than individual personal expression. In painting, color didn't really become a focus of interest until the Impressionists and the advent of the aluminum paint tube in the mid-19th century, which allowed artists to leave their dimly lit studios and venture out into the world. Gone were the days of storing paint in an animal's bladder. So how do we talk about something we only know how to take for granted? My goal for this first part of the presentation is to try and outline some practical applications for color without just putting up a color wheel and repeating what you've already heard countless times before about complementary and tertiary colors. For me, a huge inspiration for how I use color has always been movies. I think for most of us, movies are some of our first introductions to a visual art form and have shaped so much of what we try to do as artists. Unlike so many of the greatest hits of art history, we've only known our world to be full of color. Movies often use color to quickly break down visual information, and as someone interested in telling stories, there's a lot to be taken from their visual storytelling tricks. One way I love to use color is to help break up space into distinct chunks. What looks like a simple scene is heightened by the colors. Here we have three figures in front of a bright red wall, making you feel all the heat and tension of this hot summer's day. Each figure is overwhelmed by the red, but not lost in it. Sometimes it's nothing more than atmosphere. Here the loneliness of this protagonist is heightened by the fact that he's framed within a frame. He's silhouetted against this darker window with this flush of green over the whole thing. He's isolated as if he's in a fish tank. Other times it's there to lead your eye, creating focal points within focal points. Here we have the figure partially silhouetted against this orange window, the orange hue reflected in her face as well. Your eye immediately goes to this window and then you immediately go to this character's face as if you're caught in her religious fervor. Color is a tool to organize information. Here the figure in the tuxedo is essentially silhouetted against this row of pink clad dancers as a storytelling cue. Here we have a primary triad, the red of the boy's sweater, the yellow of the walls and the molding, even the runner on the ground that frames the boy in the foreground matches the girl's dresses in the background. Sometimes having no color at all creates all the contrast you need. Here in this musical number, devoid of all color, our eye immediately goes to the bright pink hair and the cream colored outfit of the beauty school dropout. Here the opposite is true, because the foreground figure is in all black, their face is framed perfectly by these teenage girl cutouts, which are more vibrant and more colorful than anything they have on. It can help clarify space through contrasting foreground. Figure in the foreground is a darker shade of this yellow, red, and orange color scheme, therefore they come forward. Their face is also partially silhouetted against this lamp. With middle ground, I love that little lip of light along the banister. And background. Not only do we have the story detail of the topiary and how the topiary matches the house in the background, the characters that are in the foreground are wearing the brightest outfits, the pink, the orange, and this blue, whereas the figures that are further back wearing green and this teal are closer in hue to the topiary. I love this row of red tables leading up to that yellow window. Because this character is wearing a darker outfit in front of this white door, the yellow window offsets that and draws us immediately to that spot. It's the spot of highest contrast in the whole composition. 
we often hear of color as a cue for emotion, which is true, but saying that doesn't do very much to break that idea down to a more technical level. Here in another green or red composition, we have these large stove hoods that are perfectly silhouetted that frame these two figures having a very intense conversation. Because of the high contrast, your eye immediately goes to the middle of the composition. Because of the large black shapes, the two figures feel diminutive in the large, overwhelming composition. Here we have another red and green composition. Up until this point in Munchkin Land, we've seen a whole slew of colors, but now that the Wicked Witch of the West has returned, wearing all black with her green face, with this red light, we've sort of stripped out a lot of this variety and can focus in on this point of high contrast. Here we have a purple and orange composition. With the light framing his eyes just so, there's an emotional intensity to this scene. Because his eyes are being hit with this orange light against this purple background, we immediately go to this point of contrast. Here we have another red and green composition. One thing to keep in mind when I talk about these sort of high intensity, high contrast compositions is that, yes, even though the red on the side of her face is the focal point, it's where our attention immediately goes, there's a lot of attention still paid to these secondary colors in the background. The side of her face that's not being hit by the light has a lot of red and orange and brown, these sort of earthier tones that balance out that red. But then also even thinking about the differences between the intensities of green. We have the green that's on our left that's darker than the green that's on our right. And if I was to be painting the scene knowing that we have red and green, but then also these orange and brown tones, that strip of what looks like black in the background, I would most likely treat as a very deep very rich blue to help balance out all parts of this composition. Sometimes the goal is to just be colorful, to let the colors be noticeable and garish and delightful. Even in the shot that is full of bright, vibrant colors that seem garish, there's still a lot of intention behind it. With the fuchsia and the purples and the reds and the blues, they're still along the same side of the color wheel. They're still cohesive in how they're approached and laid together. And then when the camera pulls out, you have this orange tapestry that frames the blue letter. There's a lot going on, but it's still attempting to build contrast through complementary colors. Here we have a dance number from Singing in the Rain. Unlike some of the previous red and green compositions I've shown, what I love about this one is that we have red and green, but also this sort of canary yellow in the middle of it. If I was to be thinking about this as a painting, how I would approach it is that we have the red and the green, we have the yellow, but then her stockings, his khaki pants, even his shirt beneath the vest, all sort of come back to this khaki. They all sort of have the same value which anchors these sort of brighter, more vibrant colors around them. Even the hat band around his hat matches his tie. You know, there's nothing superfluous despite a lot going on. What I love about this shot is the varieties of green. They're all within the same family and yet their value and their tone are all vastly different. You have the vibrant green of their dresses you have the far background, which has a lot of yellow in it. And then you have the chair in the foreground with the cavalry line in it, which has a lot of white, which is more of like a mint. The Cook, the Thief, His Wife, and Her Lover is a movie I could probably talk about for the rest of my life. But one thing that is immediately incredible about it is the way in which Peter Greenaway delineates the two major spaces of the movie. We have the dining room, which is all red, and then we have this bathroom, which is all white, and the outfits change color depending on which room the characters are standing in. It's a small detail and it doesn't really mean anything beyond what those two spaces feel emotionally. The dining room is very intense. There's a lot of intense relationship dynamics happening. The bathroom is sort of this like safe haven in the first half of this movie, but what he's doing is setting up a very easy, a very clear color cue to clue you into what those spaces, what makes those spaces different and what makes those spaces important within the narrative of the movie. One of my favorite places to look for color inspiration are the films of Douglas Sirk. His movies are known for their lush use of color and are just full of these gorgeous technicolor shots. 
Color serves a practical purpose here to help clarify storytelling beats and direct the eye. One of the things I love about this movie is Douglas Sirk gave himself a very limited palette. We have, for most of the movie, a primary triad, the blue, the yellow, the red. It creates this cozy atmosphere. Most of the movie takes place during the winter. So you have this deep blue of the snow and it creates a very intimate atmosphere, which is important because it follows this much older widow and this young hunky Rock Hudson and their sort of torrid, scandalous love affair. Even in this shot that is mostly yellow, you even have this tiniest tinge of the blue reflected on the side of their faces. One thing I've noticed with my students in the past is there's this disconnect between the things that inspire them and the practical means to sort of Frankenstein that information and take it into their own work. It's something that I think students get very intimidated because there's this idea that you should figure it out on your own, you know, that it's got to be your own work. When in actuality, there are so many places for inspiration, why not get the leg up from someone who has spent all of this time figuring out what makes an effective color scheme to make your life a little bit easier. So here we have a shot early on in the movie. I, for teaching purposes, took it into Photoshop, pumped up the saturation so we can see what some of these colors that may look a little muddled, and I broke it down into the principal elements. What looks like a lot of information we realize is really just that primary triad again. You know, we have the red, the sort of like deeper hues and the mirror frame in her own skin tone. You know, the lightest point, we have the lamp. Even the details, this branch that was given to her by Rock Hudson that she's keeping as like a keepsake, it's still an ochre color, it still matches this wall. Yes, all this information seems complicated and yet it's still serving a singular purpose of getting you to look where you need to look. Here's another example from the same Douglas Sirk film. Same scene, across the room. We have the main character's daughter. We have a lot of the same elements. We have a lamp. What I love in this shot is this lamp that has a warm shade, but then a cool light. I love all the little details. Like I love the gold trim on the lamp as well as the lamp shade, which, which matches the bed detailing. There's sort of that trim along the top triangle. How even in this background wall, we don't have the ochre, but we are replaced with sort of this like deep maroon, purpley, tone. If I was to paint this, I would definitely combine some of those oranges from her face or from the lamp detailing with the cool blue shadow on the wall to really reinforce that darker bedside table. And as you can see with the color wheel being brought back on top of it, you sort of have the, it actually lines up very nicely. You have the yellow of the lampshade, you have the blue cool tones along the wall and the lamp in the top of the table, and then you have the warmer tones in her. So there, the lamp and her sort of balance each other out, warm versus cool. You have the maroon of the back wall, which pushes everything forward. Both her and the lamp take center focus. One thing I'm very aware of putting together a slideshow of movies, most of which came out pre-year 1990, is that this way of working with color is no longer in vogue. That said, I think it is a shame that it's seen as day class A. Because if you have the opportunity to use color effectively, directing the eye and building up something beautiful, then why not? The way I see it, life is too short to pretend color doesn't exist. We're currently living through this moment where because of technology, we can really do whatever we want visual effects have taken over and left us with often washed out, overly manipulated, confusing shots. Thanos is straight up purple, and yet somehow I could not tell you that from this shot. Yes, there are colors here. Yes, there's a lot of this like brownish yellow and green sky happening, but Loki is clad in green and Thor is clad in red, and yet I couldn't tell you that if I didn't already know it. Even a movie I love with maybe the most iconic use of green, which will sometimes bring in red elements for either story beats or contrast, doesn't utilize all that color can offer. Here's a scene that should have 
a ton of emotional importance and yet is treated no different than a scene in which Keanu Reeves answered the telephone. On the other hand, a movie like Amelie, which is arguably as well known for its green and red color scheme, allows itself a wider range of hues and values and utilizes those for storytelling. The green and the red, which is in nearly every shot of the entire movie, is often offset by warmer oranges or yellows or this iconic blue, which allows each scene to feel individuated and have its own color identity, utilizing everything that it, it has in its tool belt. Even stripping out color for emotional significance. Here we have this VHS tape that is kind of the emotional climax of the whole movie, and yet it is very gray, which in a movie full of red, green, and blue is noticeable. All right, enough to chat, let's paint. So before I even lay any color down, I like to spend a moment in the beginning just looking at the piece. This is a drawing I sketched last weekend. When I'm drawing, I'm not necessarily thinking about color. I like to take this moment to sort of give myself a game plan. Some people We'll do color mock-ups. I will, maybe if it's a larger piece or if there's a client involved and I wanna make sure that the color scheme or the idea I have, something they, they would like. Sometimes I will sort of try to like recall things that I saw or sort of color details that I liked. For example, last weekend I saw this sort of like bright vinyl yellow bucket hat and I really loved that detail and I'm like, oh, I can now sort of bring that in. But this is this moment to give myself sort of take a deep breath, sort of decide what I want to paint. One of the things I love about painting is this sort of feeling of keeping everything a little off the cuff, sort of this unplanned happy accidents, whatever you would like to call it. And this is the time in which I, I try to coordinate as many of those happy accidents as possible. When I, I found that when I make a guide for myself, something that's like a color key or a uh, color after draft, even in Photoshop, there's sort of some of the fun I think is removed for me. I like not knowing. I like the suspense of sort of painting myself into a corner and hoping for the best and being like, well, that looks ugly. How do I sort of save this from myself? I found that when I'm working in Photoshop, I have a nasty habit of making everything pink and having the limitations of actual materials, be it the paints that I own at that particular moment, the amount of paint I have at that particular moment, depending on if I'm working on a larger piece and sort of having to find ways to solve problems I've made for myself. Some quick technical stuff. The gouache brand I use is Acryola, which if you don't already know, is sort of a blend between acrylic and gouache. I like it because Unlike actual gouache, it doesn't reactivate with water. It also is very light fast. It dries the color you see. It, acrylic tends to dry a little bit darker. Gouache tends to dry a little bit darker as well. Right off the bat, red and green on the palette. I tend to work in split complementaries where I use two complementary colors and mix them to make a brown which I then sort of use as a, a cement for the painting in a way. It kind of keeps all of the colors within the same family. It sort of keeps everything balanced, for lack of a better word. I've also found that working Neutral heavy then allows the sort of brighter colors to really come through and be appreciated. If everything is, is saturated, everything is sort of fighting for your attention, it's harder to have sort of color significance. I'm still just using the red and the green. I'm still trying to get as much out of these two paint colors as I can before I start adding anything more in. I'm using a hot press watercolor paper here. A 
acrylic comes in sort of a wide range of, of Easter eggy colors, ones that have a lot of white already in them. I tend to stick to sort of the most traditional paint colors and mix them myself. This way I know what I'm getting. I know some people use acrylic as sort of like a paint by number situation, but, and not to, I'm not shaming anybody for that, but I like to sort of have the most flexibility as possible. One thing I will say up front that my way of working is not the de facto way of working with gouache. I use acrylic because I had a freshman color theory teacher who just happened to assign it and one a couple years later after graduating and I decided to start painting again. I had a ton of these tubes left over that I hadn't really touched and it's kind of what stuck for me. That said, I don't know everything. I'd probably have some bad habits that people watching this might be a guess to know. I've also sped up this video, so don't think that this is how fast I normally paint. I'm always trying to think of the planes of an object. This is one of those L-shaped couches, and so there's sort of the main thrust of the couch, which has one of the figures on it, and then the other side of it, which has another figure, sort of the crook of the elbow of the couch. Knowing that there are six sides to this couch, I'm always trying to think of how do those sides of the couch interact with one another. Adding in a more saturated yellow to the part of the couch that's going to be hit with the most light. Working with a limited color scheme means that often objects will just become a full color. For example, these couch cushions that are green and red respectively, these are the colors I have in my palette. This is what I'm trying to use to define space but not making things too muddled. If everything was green, then it might fight for attention. But this way, I'm using the yellow of the couch, the green of the cushion, and then the red of the other cushion. So each object feels defined. We have the foreground of the couch, we have the figures on the couch, we have the walls, but then between the couch and the wall, how do I delineate those two spaces? How do I make them not seem like one big flush of this sort of like ochre yellow? Solution here I'm using this cast shadow from the couch on the wall by the lamp. In this early stage, I'm not really overthinking anything. I'm kind of working quickly and trying to lay down color. That way I have something to work off of. I'm not really precious about what decisions I'm making. My goal is really to kind of just get dirty, to kind of just make a mess and sort of paint my way out of it. 
I should probably switch to a bigger brush here, but I've already committed. Using a larger brush to sort of make my life a little bit easier. And then once I have enough color laid down, I will switch to something smaller. Shadows are a really great way to define space. You know, the viewer is going to be able to see that darker area and help visualize what you're painting, sort of visualize the space, visualize the way in which characters overlap or don't overlap. I tend to try to keep light sources visible just because it gives me not only a focal point, but also something to help build shadows, to help build kind of an intention behind the structure of the painting itself. Eventually I will come back in with a little rim light along that leg to really push that leg forward. And my eye will immediately go to the spot with the highest contrast. So if the darkest point and the lightest point are together, which just imagine a little bit of white along that leg, your eye will immediately go to sort of that triangle, the middle of the composition between the arm and the leg and the figure with the book. I still only have three colors on my palette with white. I don't use black. If I do use something darker, it will usually be like a darker blue or, or darker brown that's pre-mixed that I'll add into the, the palette. For the skin tone, I'm using red plus yellow, plus a little bit of the green, plus some white. So that way it will read as a tint. It will read a little bit lighter. It will read a little bit more opaquely. And so that way it will differentiate itself from the couch. Now I've added a little Prussian blue to my palette to help break up all of these warm tones with something cool. I'm also thinking that I will add, to sort of reference this Douglas Sirk scene, I will add bright blue window. And since I'm going to do that later, I want to make sure that I'm balancing out the composition early by adding in a little bit of cool tones. Since the skin tone is very brown with a lot of red in it, I want to make sure that the sock the character is scratching under reads with a high level of contrast, so I will paint that green. At this stage, I don't worry about any of the colors being too close together. I'm really just here filling in the space, and I will eventually either push or pull those shapes using shadow or highlight to make sure everything is defined clearly.
cleaning up some of my mark making with this brighter yellow, thinking about the top of the couch being hit by this light. One thing I like to keep in mind is that darker, more vibrant tones will come forward, whereas less saturated ones will recede. For example, it's why I added sort of that darker color to the foreground figure's face. That's the part that's closest to us. That's the part that's closest to the viewer. That way it's going to feel like that person is, is closer to us than this second figure, which I'm going to sort of paint using more washed out colors that are sort of already on my palette, you know, mixing them with white and sort of getting this neutral background accent color. I'm always trying to add more details back in. So for example, this idea of like a knitted hem to the top of this green sock that's slightly darker. And now I'm going back in trying to add some texture. I'm adding a lighter green on top of it. So that way it seems like a, a coarser sock. Cleaning up some of my lines here. Working with a limited palette means sometimes skin tones can get a little unnatural. For example, this is very green, but because the colors are very unified, they're all within sort of the same limited palette, overall it reads clearly. One way of thinking of a color that's not dark versus light, but rather saturated versus desaturated. One thing working with a lot of browns is you have to worry about making things too muddy. Often that process of going too dark and too muddy and too blah and then trying to pull it back is, happens a lot to me. Because it's a limited palette, sometimes the question of like, what color will I paint this object will fill in the blank for itself. With these socks, I've used green in this area. The couch is still yellow. Options are, I've got this red, maybe some white. Since it's further away from the viewer, since it's receding in space, I'll add the white to it, which will desaturate it, make it a tint, and that way it will read as farther away. Adding a little Prussian blue to those shorts to help 
break up the figure a little bit more. I'm not going to add a ton. I don't want it to read as blue. It's reading a little bit closer to a purple, but this way the accent color makes that figure stand out a little bit more, but not overwhelming the rest of the composition. I think truth be told, the way in which I paint is just a lot of repainting, a lot of this refining of colors once I've added more colors in and sort of try to re-establish what feels cohesive, what feels clear, what way in which I'm using color to communicate, for example, like ruffles around the edge of this couch. Like how do I find new ways to clarify the fact that there's a difference between this top cushion and then the sort of base of the couch itself? warming up that foreground pillow with a little bit of the brighter red. Now it's time for that ultramarine blue for that window. It's tinted with a little bit of white, but I'm definitely letting it be vibrant. Like I said in the first part of the presentation, I love using color as a way to define space within a composition. Now I'm painting the floor and part of the wall as this kind of like swamp green, Kermit the Frog. Now I'm painting the space behind the lamp. Eventually the lamp bulb will be the brightest spot in the composition, but that doesn't mean that the wall behind it should be white. Keeping in mind where the light source is, I'm now adding some shadow around that bookcase, around the molding of the window, around that radiator, which I'll eventually go back in and add some shadows to to help define. That darker green line is the 
bottom of the couch cushion and then I will eventually add back in the fringe, which I'm doing right now. Putting a little bit of this like reddish, trying to think of these as like thick woolen socks. So it's like what what feels like a thick woolen sock to me, rather than like a sleek, thin cotton Uniqlo sock. Later on, once all of the paint is sort of there and I feel satisfied with it, I would probably go back in with either uh, oil pastel or colored pencil to really get that sort of like knitted quality. Now I'm doing a kind of like warm and cool on this on these frog legs. I guess that's like a dusty rose color on the legs. Adding some darker colors on the background character's face, keeping in mind that the light is behind them so that way their face is going to be in shadow and, and then eventually I can add some light back to their ear and define some three-dimensionality. With this bucket hat, I'm going from sort of a blue green on the left to a moderate green in the middle. And then right where the light hits the shadow will be the deepest part of green. Now I'm painting the shadow underneath the couch to really try to push that couch up, sort of separate out that green from the floor, from the green from the side of the couch.
painting a shadow underneath that leg. I think that shadow is mostly green, maybe a little blue. Since the shadow underneath the couch and the shadow under the leg are both shadows, I'm gonna to try to keep them of the same color. Now I'm adding some cast shadows, thinking about that light, thinking about the light source, thinking about ways to push some of these more similar hues apart from one another. Trying to really define that shape between the thigh and the calf. Yes, there's that dusty rose color, but now I'm going to come in with a little bit of the blue to really define where that limb is overlapping the other. Same with the shadow underneath the elbow, same with the shadow underneath the face. I think it's true of most things, but I think the only way to get better at something is jumping right in. My approach to gouache, I've just learned from painting with gouache, which feels like a cop out and I apologize for it, but is the truth. What I love about real materials is that everyone's use of them is just naturally going to be different. Everyone's hands function differently. Everyone's ideas of how color should function are gonna be different. Thank you so much for watching my video. If you have any questions at all, do not hesitate to reach out.